and welcome. So it, it looks like we may not have a chat and we're still working some technical difficulties. So bear with us. Um, good morning. I am Janet Gill, Environmentally Endangered Lands Program Director or EEL Program as it is commonly called. I will be the host and presenter today and I would like to go over the presentation logistics and see a few words before we begin. First, I would like to point out that this presentation will be interactive throughout with apparently some bumps. Um, EEL program or EEL program associated staff and myself will be narrating and discussing the history of the EEL program and its role in acquiring, managing and protecting Pine Rocklands in Miami-Dade County. You, the audience, are also invited and actually requested to participate in the dialogue. If you have questions, please use the chat box, or maybe not, you may have to raise your hand. We'll figure it out in the next few minutes. And a staff member, Christine, will read it out loud. If you wish to speak, please indicate it. So once again, we're working on it. Um, so for now, use the raise the hand feature and we'll figure it out. Thank you guys. Um, please note, we are going to have to limit some of the dialogue because of time constraints. Apparently it's much longer than I thought. However, we can always set up future meetings where we can delve deep into the issues that you guys would like to discuss, specifically the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos, please. <laughs> so, um, second, be advised this meeting will be recorded and anyone not wishing to be recorded just needs to sit back and enjoy. Last, I would like to ask staff to introduce themselves as I call out their names. Please state your name and what your role is as part of the EO program and in protecting Pine Rocklands. Christina Oliva. Hello, I'm Christina Oliva. I am the secretary for EO. Thank you, Christine. Joy Klein. Good morning, I'm Joy Klein. I'm in charge of management for the Endangered Lands Program. And she's been with us since the beginning, since before EEL was even created. She's always had a role. So Age of the dinosaurs. No, she's my she's my legacy and my my institutional knowledge. The woman is incredible for all of you in the Pine Rockland community. You already know that. Um, James Duncan. Hi, my name is uh, uh, James Duncan and I'm a preserve manager for the Oak program. I also um, work uh, with endangered species policy and a program adjacent and interacting with um, the Oak program um, in housed in Durham. So, um, as we go through our dialogue, we'll also be showing stuff on screen. So bear with us as there may inevitably which there has already been um, technical difficulties, but it won't let us stop the flow or the dialogue, hopefully. Um, so. Okay, let's start. Pine Rockland Work Group Symposium 22 years later, past, present, and future of Pine Rocklands. In keeping with the conference theme, Eel decided on back to the future, where we were and where we are now. I want to begin with the abstract posted on the website and to circle back to the question I posed in the blurb. Over 30 years ago, the EEL program was born out of the concern for the continuing loss of pylons and other environmentally sensitive areas. In an effort to address these concerns, the EEL program was established to acquire, preserve, enhance, restore, conserve, and maintain environmentally endangered lands for the benefit of present and future generations. Today, the EO program is responsible for managing over 82 nature preserves comprising over 26,000 acres of environmentally sensitive land, including 1,632 acres of pine rocklands. In addition, there are currently 336 acres of pine rocklands still on our acquisition list, and we will get 
to what that is a little bit later in the presentation. And the EEL program continues to add more acreage of these sensitive areas. So here's the question. How do we continue to protect this fragile and precious habitat in the face of dwindling funds, climate change, sea level rise, management of fire dependent communities in hyper fragmented urban landscapes, continued extinction of species and the ever present development pressures? So I gave you a hint as to the answer when I stated, tune in and all will be revealed. Well, probably not all, but at least we can begin to work on it together. So the great revelation is that we cannot do this without all of you. This presentation is a call for unity help because if we don't do this together, we will lose this globally imperiled habitat. Next slide. The next slide hand up. From a Manny Cora. Um, okay, have we figured out the technical difficulties yet? Oh uh, yes, Mel can remove from panelists. Okay, um, so let's move Manny. Manny, can you unmute, please? Okay, maybe not. Okay, keep it going. Okay, thank you. So, Pine Rockland, the beginning. So, um, this is, in Miami-Dade County, there were 185,000 acres of Pine Rockland habitat, including within Everglades National Park. This is only in Miami-Dade County, guys, not the Keys. Um, at this point, Everyone in their presentation has gone over how settlers came down and basically the Pine Rocklands were the first, um, the first pieces of property that got developed because they were on higher ground and they were easily, they were easy to build homesteads on. So um, next, the Everglades National Park gets established in 1947, and those pine rocklands become protected. No, no, stay in the slide before, sorry. However, development continues outside this park. Um, this seems like a good time to talk about what pine rocklands are and some of their characteristics in Miami-Dade County. You want to go over it, Joy, really quick? Sure. Um, pine rocklands are unique. Um, Pineland that has kind of like an open savanna grassland with the South Florida slash pine and lots of endemic grasses and herbaceous components. Again, it's a fire driven community. Yeah, and please note that um, the pine rocklands in South Florida have an open canopy of pines and have a specific South Florida slash pine associated with them that is different from the ones in other parts of the Caribbean. So any questions at this point? Okay, next slide. Next slide. 1975, Pine and Hammock Forest Lands of Dade County. The report prepared by, Chris, by Cliff Shaw was to assist the county in their efforts to preserve natural areas. It was the first inventory of Dade County's remaining pine and hammock forest communities outside of Everglades National Park. Why was this report so important? This report put a face on the fragmentation of these urban forests and it set the stage for what was to come next. Thank you, Cliff. <laughs> next slide, please. The 80s. While people were partying, they were also protecting. So we're going to go over the Conservation and Recreation Lands Program, also referred to as CARL, the Natural Forest Community Ordinance. Um, also referred to as NFC, and EEL program, when it was just a vision and lots of hard work. So in 1979, the Florida 
legislature established the Conservation and Recreation, CARLS program, to acquire lands of environmental and cultural significance. It is important to note that during the 1980s, CARL staff, along with Miami-Dade County staff, were evaluating environmental lands in Miami-Dade County. Most of these evaluations would become very important in the foundation of the EO program. In addition, the earliest preserves that EO began to manage were CARL owned. These, were, these preserves were part of what is now called the Dade County Archipelago. Um, Joy, you want to talk about the 1984 NFC ordinance? In, in the early 80s, there was a very progressive county commissioner named Harvey Ruin, who was very, um, he had a lot of foresight and he looked towards the future uh, as far as sea level rise, sustainability. And he was the main sponsor of a ordinance in 1984 that helped protect these few upland remaining habitats in Miami-Dade County. It basically took away a lot of the development rights of the county, um, I mean, of the private developers and put restrictions on it. What they did at that time, they didn't have the resources to go out in the field and evaluate every area. So the, the county forester at the time took, basically took aerial photographs and drew circles around areas he thought should have these um, development restrictions on it. As a result, there were some properties missed and properties added to the list that weren't great. But if we didn't have this ordinance, there would have been nothing left to save. Then um, again, with Mr. Rubin's um, very good vision, he decided that the best way to protect these lands instead of forcing just private landowners not to develop them, was for the county to buy them and acquire them to hold on to them into perpetuity. So in the late 80s, we a lot of us started working on phone banks to see if we could get a land acquisition program passed locally. Although the state had its own program, we felt our, our small parcels wouldn't be of the size or the caliber that this necessarily that the state would buy. So we wanted our own program to try to protect things locally. Yeah, and so before we go into the next slide, I wanna say, you know, it's not, the NFC ordinance, uh, which is regulatory, alongside the EO program, which is proprietary, are just two pieces of what can help protect these resources in Miami-Dade County. It isn't the end all but it is a step in the right direction. So next slide, please. So 1990, um, thank you, Harvey Rubin. <laughs> Miami-Dade County voters approved a referendum to acquire, preserve, enhance, restore, conserve, and maintain environmentally endangered lands for the benefit of present and future generations. The Yield program was established to implement this mandate. When the tax um, totaled $90 million, $10 million of those dollars were put into the management trust fund and $80 million were put to acquire the lands at the time. As time went on, the management fund continued to grow because we were still in our baby steps of acquiring until we had enough to begin managing. Once again, what we were managing at the beginning was primarily uh, Carl Lands. So next slide. More on the EO program. So the EO program ordinance was created and EO program policies and procedures adopted. Originally the EO ordinance was chapter 24A of the Miami-Dade County Code. It was later changed to chapter 2450 of the Miami-Dade County Code. Miami-Dade County Board of County Commissioners places the Miami Rock Ridge Pinelands on the yield acquisition list. So that just note the Pine Rocklands, even since the beginning of the program were considered to be um, extremely valuable, even by the Board of County Commissioners. 
the Miami Rock Ridge Pinelands acquisition project was put on the list in 1993, and it was one of the first three projects to get added. This one, the tropical hardwood hammocks and Deering South Edition. No. The Land Acquisition Selection Committee, or LASC for short, is an eight member board with one member being an alternate. The primary responsibility of the LASC is to recommend to Miami-Dade County's Board of County Commissioners a semi-annual acquisition list. What does that mean? Properties eligible to be considered for acquisition and management under the yield program are only environmental, ancillary, or buffer lands. Ancillary and buffer lands need to be adjacent to the environmental land and have to meet specific criteria related to the environmental land. This program is by no means a parks and recreation program, but a true conservation and preservation program. The VCC, the Miami-Dade County Board of County Commissioners, accepts and approves properties for acquisition and or management for the yield program. The yield program can only buy properties that are on the approved list or properties that are offered for conveyance or donation and accepted by the VCC. So what happens at this point? The, um, the Pine Rocklands get on our list and we begin to acquire. So our first acquired Pineland Preserves by the Yield Program were Nixon Smiley Pineland Edition and Sunny Palms Pineland Preserve. They were acquired in 1993. Our first managed preserve was in 1991 and it was our lovely Trinity Pineland. And that one was Carl owned. Next slide. Christine, if anyone raises their hand, thank you. 1992 and Hurricane Andrew. On August 24th, 1992, a category five storm named Hurricane Andrew hit South Florida with wind speeds of a, around 170 miles per hour. Not only was this a significant event to highlight in the history of Pine Rocklands, but it is actually a very relevant topic as some of our partner Pine Rockland protectors in the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos have suffered recently from similar events. Joy, would you like to address some of these things? Yeah, next slide, please. Just to give you a little idea of what had happened. Next slide, please. In Thank the you. very top left corner is the Deering Estate. And you'll notice that the, all the trees are down and the debris. There was 17 feet of salt water um, inside the building and over our Pine Rockland in the Deering Estate. And the wreck line from all the debris was also far inland and covering a lot of the Pine Rockland. And right below that is one of our twisted snags. And this is again from the vortex or the little tornadoes that spun off Hurricane Andrew. After the storm, the US Weather Service actually did a mapping using our pine tree angles and that of all the different vortexes that hit during the storm. And the middle picture shows what it looked like on the ground. It looked like our pine rocklands had just been scarred, everything blown away lots of trees down, twisted. Initially, after the storm, we lost about 50% of our canopy. In the right, top right-hand corner, you'll see one of our preserves, Sunny Palms, the before and after the storm went through. It twisted trees, it snapped trees off, but what happened is by damaging all these trees and having a one age class tree, the trees weren't able to bend and move without hitting each other and they all scraped bark and twisted and so the trees started oozing turpentine and before we know it within a year after Hurricane Andrew we lost 98 percent of our pine tree canopy just due to turpentine beetles ips and there were two or three new beetles that were actually discovered in Miami-Dade County. At this point people felt 
that we had completely lost our pine limbs and that they would never be back. Um, trees were tipped up. It looked, it looked like dire straits. They, again, they were afraid of wildfires. We had special hurricane crews come in to try to do prescribed burns to prevent massive wildfires. And one of the things, that, one of the mistakes we made was when we lost so much canopy, we thought we needed to go in and restore the canopy. Unbeknownst to us, when the storm hit in August, most of the trees were full of pine cones. And so about five years after Andrew hit, we began to see Andrew's babies, natural regeneration coming up. So in a lot of these areas that we got concerned and we looked at replanting, we didn't have to replant because Andrew's babies were coming up. And not only were they coming up, not having any competition for sunlight, like in a lot of our sites, these pines grew much faster than when we ever imagined. So there are lessons learned about canopy and having these even age stands and not having the sites prescribed burn. So what we have tried to do now is have a much more open canopy with different age classes. So if we do get a storm and we lose the big trees to beetles or stress from twisting or drought, We'll still have some younger trees coming up in, in the uh, understory and the sub canopy so that we are able to continue prescribed burning these pine lands. The needles from the pine trees are really important for um, prescribed burning because they provide a lot of fine fuels that help us do prescribed burning. Next slide, so, please. Joy, wait, wait. So let me, let me sort of circle back to this, which I didn't mention. Um, and I want to make sure that the folks from the Bahamas hear this. Um, according to we Wikipedia, in total, Andrew destroyed more than 63,000 houses, damaged more than 124,000 others, caused $23.3 billion in damage, and left 65 people dead. In addition, about 250,000 people were left homeless in Dade County. So, as you can see, there's a message of hope in this. Miami-Dade County has recovered and our pine forests have recovered. And we just want to wish you guys the best and know that we're a resource here, that we're available and that um, we can help as a sounding board because that's what we're all going to do. Um, so thank you. Um, next slide. This is Joy, back to you. In the uh, beginning of the yield program, all the biologists were housed under the Department of Environmental Resource Management. And the director and a few environmental planners were located in our planning department. And officially for a while, we were in the county manager's office. And so the biologists worked um, very hard right after the storm to work on the endangered plants of Miami-Dade County because we were so worried about the condition and the, the state of our pine rocklands. So in 1993, we did a whole endangered plants of Dade County study. And then in 1994, the Richmond Management Plan. The Richmond is the area around Zoo Miami, Metro Zoo, Larry Penny Thompson, Martinez, a lot of those lands were still in federal ownership at the time. And this whole area totaled about a thousand acres and was our most intact pine rockland outside of Everglades National Park. And not only was it intact, it also had a lot of the rare and endangered species that did not occur in the national park. So it was a high um, priority area especially now that some of the federal agencies were starting to surplus their lands because their buildings were destroyed or, or whatever. Back in 1985, though, the, the county manager's office thought it would be um, more coordinated to have the endangered lands actually in what is called Durham, the Department of Environmental Resource Management, which is now the Division of Environmental Resource Management. Since the biologists were already housed in Durham, they thought having the 
the environmental planner and the director of EEL would help improve coordination and communication within the department. So that's when EEL was moved under the um, Department of Environmental Resource Management. So I, well, one second. So the program, the EEL program still resides in Durham. However, you know, I'm gonna circle back to this later, but we are, an extremely small program and we still sort of farm out most of what we do to different areas within the county and to contractors and to different folks. So one of the things that I think is one of our future needs, and I'll go into it later, is uh, staffing for the old program. So let's move on to the next. 2003, from pros to you. In 2003, the Miami-Dade County Parks and Recreation Department, as it was called then, applied to include multiple sites into the old program. Through four Board of County Commissioner resolutions, 2,897 acres of natural areas within 18 parks were accepted into the EO program for the purposes of management in perpetuity as environmental lands in accordance with the purposes and requirements of the EO program. Of the 18 parks, at least 10 or more contain pine rockland habitat. So why is this important to a program that manages approximately 26,000 acres? Well, because most of that acreage happens to be wetlands that are within um, an acquisition project in the southern part of the county. But these 2,897 acres, when they were transferred into the yield program, more than doubled the amount of pine rockland habitat that the yield program was now responsible for managing. So it was a significant event from a management perspective from a funding perspective, from a lot of things, this really changed the way the EO program managed its lands. Next slide, please. Okay, um, I'm gonna take over for a, a, a little bit. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what's ha what has happened in the past uh, seven or so years. Um, this, the title of this talk is called Back to the Future. And yesterday we learned a little about, about like uh, Amorpha pinnulata, pinnulata lead plant and other federally endangered species. Recently, however, um, we have uh, got a new additional species listed at under the Endangered Species Act um, by the federal government, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I know the Fish and Wildlife Service will be having its own uh, panel discussion um, as part of this uh, symposium. However, we want to take a moment and mention of what this um, means for you. Um, so this is designated, um, uh, the species designated as endangered under the Major Species Act specific to pine rockets. It's meant for the first time, um, we have federal designation of uplands in an urban area in Miami County of critical habitat. So critical habitat being the, uh, the federal lingo for us in the county, our policy is habitat critical um, uh, to the survival of endangered species. Um, this has created a regulatory and technical processes that have created new acquisition opportunities, new learning opportunities, and um, uh, new advocacy um, opportunities for both the county, the feds, the public, and other stakeholders. Um, what this means for EEL, um, we will need a habitat conservation plan to uh, cover our management activities and we're working on, on, on that with the help of our federal and state partners. Um, it means uh, that we have new tools and it means new, um, new opportunities arise. Yeah, I, I do want to point out that it also means more responsibility for us. You know, these are the kinds of things that sit on my shoulders as an EO program director that sometimes keep me up at night that um, we, you know, these critical habitat designations means we have to do our last ditch effort to make sure that our pine rockland plants and wildlife do not go extinct. It helps us get better. 
Uh, next slide. Right. Oh, sorry. Um, first, 2019 and 2020 Pine Rockland acquisitions. So I want to point out that the yield program has been acquiring lands since it, the original projects got put on our list. Why am I highlighting these two, these, well, it's three properties, but these two major acquisitions? Because we have not purchased this much Pine Rockland acreage since before 1997. What does that mean? Has the O program been sitting around lazily not doing its job? Absolutely not. Two, some things play a key role in this. Number one, we are an absolute willing seller program. That means even though you're on our list, if you don't want to sell to us, we can't purchase your property. Secondly, there's not a lot of Pine Rocklands to go around. So those that are on our list, there are few, but if the people don't want to sell, they just don't. These particular um, acquisitions that we did in 2019 and 2020 were Oh, well, the school board Pineland and Navy Wells number two owned by both the school board since 1993 and before, but they were on our list since 1993, were in the list since the beginning of the program and they were not willing to sell. After years, the school board came to us and told us that they'd be willing to become a willing seller. This was ecstatic. Our relationship with the school board is incredible. They have their mission and their mandate, and we respect that entirely because education of our school age children is, you know, the foundation of us as a society. But I want to say that the relationship is integral into the preservation of these lands for the future, and it couldn't be better. Thank you, school board. And I'd also like to do a shout out to the students and teachers at Air Base K through 8. This school is located directly adjacent to the Pine Rockland. And if it wasn't for the engagement of students and the teachers who brought to the school board attention how important and valuable this land was, and they asked to use it as an outside classroom. So it was really those that grassroots effort that brought the school board's attention to these properties that said, oh, we can't, we can't destroy these for schools. We need to sell it. So thank you to Hannah Purcell and all the people at um, Airbase K through eight. Grassroots does work with government, believe it or not. Yes, and if there's any school board folks here, we'd also like to give a shout out to Fernando Alberni and Anna Rijo Conde, which were fundamental in working with us, and Mike Levine. I mean, we really, really love working with the school board now. We're really grateful for it. Um, and then there's other teachers out there, like Daniel Valle, right, Joy? Which um, the the teacher from MAST and um, one of Susan. I think he's Danny. Biotech. I think you're on the, uh, I think you're, you might be on the uh, attending the, the lecture. So, oh. so if Daniel's on, thank you. You're, you're great. One of Suzanne's students, Lisette, that she mentioned yesterday at West Miami is a teacher that's always making her students attend our work day events and is really involved. And um, in addition to that, we also, I know I'm diverging, but the, you know, the teachers and the students are important and they're important to our mission. Um, so thank you guys. You're just fantastic. Um, so, and then Calderon also, that that one I think was placed in our list in 1995 and they were an unwilling seller also. So these, this, these acquisitions were fundamental to just, you know, furthering our mission of acquiring 
environmentally sensitive lands, and we look forward to continuing to acquire pine rocklands in the near future. Um, so, James, you want to add? Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, Calgary Pineland, um, the county has had a 40 year history with this property. Um, it's a 15 acre island that was. Um, uh, uh, maybe low to moderately and moderate to high degradation um had high activities um it had intermittent management sometimes mismanagement um and uh this impetus and focus on pine rocklands got it acquired and it's really close to some of our most critically important pine rocklands such as the the richmond pine rockland and it's um grounds hopefully ground zero for um some of the restoration um, um methods that that the uh, eel program um, is, is working on the um, the school board pylons. Just to reiterate, long time wish list. I mean, these things have even gone before the school board, and through advocacy, through these the synergistic, synergistic relationships and call outs by um, by state partners, federal partners about how important pine rocklands are. Um, the school board came came to us, like I mentioned, and uh, they're both properties. Um, were slated to be developed as schools. Both properties are de designated critical habitat for the Bartram Scrub Air Street and um, uh, some more pine rocking plants. And they are uh, beautiful, beautiful, um, unique uh, eel preserves. And yeah. Oh, and one footnote out. before we go on to the next slide. And not only did the school board um, become a willing seller, for the first time in the history of the program, the school board put in an application for one of their properties to be added to our list. So it's only good things to come. Next slide, please. The future of Pine Rocklands and the Yield Program. I know this is a little bit out of order to state your goals, but I am gonna do it now. Mm -hmm. um, the goal is to acquire all the lands on the Yield Acquisition List and all the lands that will be added as part of the process, restore and manage the eel preserves to their highest level of eco ecological function and to prevent the further extinction of plant and animal species. I know, lofty. Additional goals are to increase public awareness of these environmentally sensitive areas and the public's role in helping it protect them. Next slide. So our challenges emitting these goals. Um, dwindling funds, like I mentioned earlier, in our original voter mandate in 1990, um, had $90 million set aside for you. Well, Miami-Dade County property <laughs> costs are extremely high, especially in the urban areas. So that has taken a chunk of our money. And other than a 2004 government obligation bonds that added an additional 40 million to acquire property um, in Miami-Dade County through the old program, we have not received um, additional funding. We have gotten money through grants, through, um, through the conservation and recreation program, sorry, the CARL program, and um, and a lot of additional grants and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we are running out of money. So we need to address this. Then I circle back to staffing needs of the old program. We, you know, we talked at the beginning, our program director was in one place, our biologists were in another place. And, you know, that pattern continues in the old program. But more than just being you know, having outsourcing most of everything we do and having things in different places, we just don't have enough people on the ground to do this. It's almost like we didn't really think about growing the program from a staffing need, it, you know, concurrently with the growing responsibility of the program. So climate change <laughs> for all of for everyone in South Florida and the Caribbean, I'm sure that these are issues that they're dealing with. And so, you know, it's just some, a new additional challenge added to already a very large growing list of things. Um, new and emerging invasive species. So we, 
we have new species. Really, we we have a term for it down here in South Florida. It's, you know, our, and through our eSisma, I'm going to give you guys a plug later too. It's EDRR, which is early detection rapid response and how to deal with these new invasive species before they become multi-million dollar problems, not only for ourselves, but the other folks in the Keys and North Florida. Because as we're finding a lot of these species, just if we don't take care of the problem here in Miami-Dade County, it'll become everybody's problem eventually. Um, managing urban fragmented urban forests, disrupted irregular fire regime, increased inappropriate uses, and maintaining historical conditions. It's really daunting. Unwilling sellers and remaining acquisitions, and then development pressure and disappearing natural areas. So it leads us to the question of how do we preserve our biodiversity in the face of this continued development pressure and all these challenges. Well, if you look at this um, picture here, as opposed to the first one, we have a lot less than we used to. Everyone uses, you know, less than 2%, less than 1.8%. But the truth is, our NFC program, you know, it, it does provide some semblance of protection, but it does allow portion of these sites to be developed. In addition to that, the yield program is only a willing seller program. So folks can develop their property. So what does that mean? This footprint, although it's horrible to think about, is just getting smaller by the day. So one of the ideas that's been floating around for the past few years, and it's actually becoming cemented, is we just need to expand the footprint. It is no longer an option to not do that. The problem is that eel is only part of the puzzle, but not the answer. It is very, very limited in what it can do. So we need to have other folks involved. Um, so next slide. So where are our opportunities? In partnerships, contractors, and the public. I really want to focus on this slide because this, to me, is the answer. Um, so let me begin with partnerships. Miami-Dade County, our sister departments, public works, BO program, contracts, um, Miami-Dade Public Works real estate officers to do the closings on the yield acquisition contracts. We just do not have in-house real estate officers. So these public works real estate officers who, by the way, do acquisitions not only for yield, but also for transportation needs in the county, they, they work great with our program. You know, we couldn't do it without that group. And they have managed just recently to get 20 through, 22 contracts through BCC in, and have them closed in less than a year. That is monumental. These guys, I don't think they sleep. So um, I wanna, you know, say thank you. So just know that they're key in, in achieving what I'm gonna read next. The county, in partnership with the South Florida Water Management District, the state of Florida, and other for funding partners, has acquired approximately 23,064 acres of land in Miami-Dade County since the exception of the yield program through June 30th, 2020. Another county partner that is in another department is Natural Areas Management. They are within the Parks, Rec, and Open Spaces Department. Currently, the O program restores and manages over 82 preserves, totaling more than 26,000 acres. The O program contracts the NAM crews to perform exotic removal on some of these eel managed areas. For example, in fiscal years 2017 and 2018, eel contracted NAM to conduct invasive plant removal on 1,362 acres 
and then 2,074 acres respectively within these EO preserves. Please note that EO also contracts outside vendors and contractors to conduct invasive plant removal or heavy machinery projects within EO preserves. However, I want to point out that we rarely contract, if, if I don't think ever, contract out the work in our pine rocklands because of the endemicity of the plants and just the incredible knowledge of our NAM crews. I've heard it being said by some folks in the state, they are just the best crews in the entire state of Florida. So you guys are wonderful. The work in Pine Rocklands, I want to point out, is our most expensive because of the treacherous terrain, the conditions of which they have to work, and the hardwood reduction is extremely expensive. In addition, four NAM staff are also paid by the yield program to help oversee and administer some yield preserve management activities. So thank you to those folks also doing a good job. So next partner, our researchers, um, FIU. Suzanne Comter, um, we love you. Mike Ross, FIU professors that we've been working with for years. Some of them having been on our actual last committee, I think Brad Bennett also. So it's just been a wonderful relationship with our FIU professors. And then the University of Florida, ben, Benjamin Baser and Lauren Troda. Um, they have, now they have one of our EEL interns over there also. Um, they actually are, have made it part of their mission to work in Pine Rocklands. And that is just invaluable to us as we, number one, do not have the capacity and sometimes even the knowledge to be able to do the research necessary to be able to manage and restore these habitats. Um, so we want to say thank you to um, FIUUF and other universities throughout the entire country that help us be able to manage these lands better. Then I want to go into our state and federal agency partners, FDP, Florida Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Commission, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, and the U.S. Florida Fish and Wildlife Service, sorry, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and others that we cannot be without. So I know some of you are on our talk today, and I want to say that your help is invaluable to helping the EEL program reach its goals and its missions. Um, some of these partners are part of our Everglades CISMA, which is our Everglades Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. And that is a big partnership where we have all agreed to work together and manage in, within the Everglades footprint. So thank you guys. And New on the scene, well, maybe not so new, but they've now taken a more active role with the EEL program is the North American Butterfly Association. They've recently really ramped up their coordination with the EEL program, and they're looking to provide possible corridors for small regnant preserves to be able to connect the dots between areas for our butterflies to be able to migrate. So thank you, Nava. Now I want to go into um, some folks that straddle the lines of both partnerships and contractors. I want to begin with Fairchild Tropical Botanic Gardens. Um, they have a Connect to Protect program that Jen Posley spoke about the other day. That is part of our partnership with them. We're looking to bring these citizen scientists, bring these folks interested in the Pine Rockland community and help them provide these corridors and these special pieces and help us just keep an eye out for our sites and be able to just, you know, engage the public with them. So thank you. And we plan to continue that into the future. So thank you, Connect to Protect. And then they're also a contractor for us. Fairchild had, you know, has had a contract with the county for multiple years now that Jen went into where they do plant 
um, monitoring for us. They have done other things, but their main focus is to be able to do some rare plant monitoring and reintroductions and seed collection and everything else that Jen went into. So thank you. Um, the next, um, the next folks who straddle that line are the Institute for Regional Conservation or IRC. You know, they created the floristic inventory of South Florida back in 1994. And I can tell you that our eel program managers look to that all the time. They do, they do a two-step process. They look at the floristic inventory and then they call GenPo and um, a fair child just to make sure that any restoration work that they do is in line with the missions and the goals of the EO program and that they don't inadvertently damage um, t &E species. And then in addition, recently IRC received a Pine Rockland grant and they've been working to manage in some of our eel preserves. So thank you for that also. I do want to point out that we have contracted their work in the past and may continue to do so depending on the needs of the program. So thank you guys. We love you. And um, last but not least is the Nature Conservancy. We have um, an acquisition contract with them where they negotiate um, these willing seller contracts, which then get handed over to public works where they can do the closings on them. So we have an in-house contractor that people sometimes forget is not really eel staff per se, because he sits in our office and he works with us all the time. So thank you, Roberto. And they also are a partner with us because Chris, if you're on this call and the folks associated with that, we've been working with the Nature Conservancy for years on the Pine Rockland Working Group Conference on the mission of, you know, Pine Rockland restoration on, you know, just general TNC things. And just a few years ago, through a donor, we were able, through TNC's partnership with us and a donor, we were able to acquire some Pine Rockland properties. So know that, you know, all you guys are invaluable to us. So, Contractors, little program, lots of responsibility. So one of the things we also contract out is our invasive plant removal. Um, number one, there's just not enough NAM crews. And number two, they are a really specialized hit team. And sometimes we don't need those special services for areas that are really disturbed that just require, you know, general blitzing. Um, heavy equipment contractors, the, that's something that we definitely need to ramp up in the future through our restoration initiatives. Um, and basically, one of our unmet needs is having the equivalent of a Fairchild plant monitoring contract, but specific to wildlife, especially now that we have critical habitat and the habitat conservation plan is a thing for us. So we have had sporadic wildlife surveys in the past, but never a concerted effort like our plant monitoring contracts. So, and then fences, signs, and surveys. Um, Joy, who can put a grumpy face now, has to work with our procurement folks to just get this. And, you know, this is a vast majority of her frustration, I think, is just going through, you know, the county's procurement process to be able to install these signs and these fences and to get some surveys. So, but we are counting on um, on our folks just getting these things to fruition. So, and finally, I think the most important, if not equally important part of this puzzle is the public. So I go back to education. The EO program has hosted over 11,500 volunteers during its EO volunteer workday events since 2010. That's getting the word out. These are folks that are truly interested in the EO program and they come out here and we need them to voice their concern. Why? Because the EO program needs support. 
We need you guys to be our eyes and ears. We need you, if the EO program decides to do another referendum, be the people out there championing the program and its things. So um, thank you. And then we also would like to harness the power of citizen science. We've been trying to use um, apps such as iNaturalist and events as such to bring an awareness to our county. Years ago, we, um, I wanna say like three years ago when we initially did our our first iNaturalist, we, we documented a rare species of butterfly. I think we caught the Bartrams, which is a federally endangered butterfly in one of our sites during the event. And then following that, we actually got um, biodiversity um, we were ranked one of the top um, cities in, um, in the world, I think, from a biodiversity standpoint during our city nature challenge. So it, it really, it brings awareness to our program. Um, so I think I'm done here. Okay, next slide. You have to wrap it up, Janet. We're okay. Thank you. Current projects and next steps. Um, I know the slide shows it like this, but these things are not in a progressive pattern. They are all occurring concurrently, which is continuing to acquire and manage, replenishing the funds that are definitely an issue, and then planning for land stewardship. That one's a little bit more complicated. What do we mean by that? Determining appropriate use and involvement, education, sense of pride and ownership in our preserves. And we are trying to come up with preserve management plans for that and our future um, restoration plans for these sites. You know, the habitat conservation plan for the ill managed pine rockland, which we look to be working with um, our FWC partners, and I think Tom's on this, um, so thanks, Tom, and um, and our U.S. Fish and Wildlife partners. Thank you, you know, Ashley and all you guys. You're awesome. And then the Pine Rockland Business Plan, where um, that's the step where we're looking to expand the footprint, and Eel is a core team member of that, so, and, you know, we'll be on the panel at when their topic comes up, I think at the end of the week. So looking forward to it, guys. Um, next step, um, next line. Information sharing. So this is our website and our phone number. If you guys are interested in knowing more about the Yield program and doing follow-up meetings with all, with us, anything, these are our contact information. Plus, we would also um, try to provide some links to Jen so she can post them on the Pine Rockland Working Group website um, that are specific to you, if you guys are interested. So thank you. And then this is the end where I wanna say thank you to Jen Posley of Fairchild for all the hard work she did to make sure this conference took place. Jen, we couldn't have done it without you. I would also like to thank everyone that really played key roles in this conference. Also, um, EO program staff, Fairchild staff, and the Nature Conservancy. Thank you all. We can't do it without you guys. Any, any questions? I thought it'd be more interactive. It turned out to be the Janet show, as usual. You know, with a little bit of James and Joy sprinkled in. Other questions, just raise your hands and we will allow you to talk. Anybody? Yeah. I have Daniel Valle raising his hand. Yeah. Can you please oh. allow him to talk now? Yes. Hi, Daniel. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to say great presentation. Um, I actually have a question for Joy Klein. Would, would she be able to answer? Of course, of course. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Joy. Um, hi, Daniel. How are you? Good. You have your students today? I so they're actually on a on a lunch break right now. I had them earlier for the earlier talk. I, I'm sorry, for, uh, I had them yesterday, but I'm gonna have them again for the 2 p.m. Turks and Caicos. Anyway, I wanted to say um, 
as you as you are very well aware, my students are very involved and very motivated. Anything has to do with my Rothlands. Um, so, you know, in terms of like research projects that they hope to do with bond and the bats and go for tortoises and all types of uh, Miami tiger beetles and all types of stuff, endangered stuff. However, I'm trying to get um, more of the staff and, and, and hopefully administration in my school at biotech involved. Um, and I heard you mentioning, um, I heard Janet mentioning um, some school, uh, a school that got uh, the school board on, well, on board. And I guess I wanted to to see if you could me email me and, and maybe like summarize what the, the, the processes that they took uh, to get that uh, going. Certainly. Well, yeah, and maybe we can talk to the teachers that actually did a lot of this legwork and maybe um, potentially ask if they can connect with you to to, you know, have an open dialogue about, you know, how to get um, the principal and the schools uh, on your side, because I know it took Hannah years to to get them to listen. So, but your school is is already there and it won't take a whole lot to get them more involved. So I'm I'm uh, still very happy to work with your school as much as I can. So. And yeah. don't we have uh, another teacher, Tina? Isn't she also there? Yeah, Dr. Whalen yeah. is also somebody we work with a lot. So we're more than happy to yeah. keep, keep our relationship with with biotech, especially yeah. any of the, especially these schools that are located in or next to Pine Rocklands, you've got such a great opportunity for our outdoor classroom that we will do everything we can to try to assist with that. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Now we have Leslie raising her hand. Uh, Melanie, please allow her to speak. Oh, I think I brought her over. Don't touch, Melanie had it. <laughs> OK, don't touch. Uh, my question is just, what can an ordinary citizen do to help your cause, our cause, and you know what do you need us to do on the ground? I guess volunteer, but I haven't seen those opportunities. I guess I can just send in my name and address or email. But what else can we do? Um, so, so normally we do have EO volunteer events, but because of COVID and social distancing and all this stuff, we haven't been able to have them so far. But we're looking to reinitiate them in the near future, then you can always um, go to our website, which is, you know, if you just Google Environmentally Endangered Lands Program Miami-Dade County, you can see there. And we tend to post our calendar when we do have events available. But the, the most important part is, you know, connecting through those events with us, but spreading the word. Yeah, and Leslie, I'd like to add um, that just by being here today and listening to us and interacting and asking a question like that question, um, uh, that is exactly what, what what we need. We need people to be kind of like uh, mini ambassadors in, in the um, uh, in the Greater Miami Dade community. That one know what our program is, and two know how important it is for our way of life here in Miami Dade County. And we don't have too many public talks like this. Um, maybe in the future, that's something that'll, that'll change. But um, just by being here, that's like really, yeah. really important. And, and sharing what I, you want. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a shameless plug. You can also it help the EO program by, you know, joining Connect to Protect. If you're not a part of that yet, that that is a fundamentally important sister, you know, partner program that we mentioned earlier, where, you know, I just, I don't, I don't, I, too much information, too many lands to manage, but I can tell you that I believe multiple, um, multiple homeowners that are part of the Connect to, Pro to Protect program have been invaluable in providing that corridor concept for us. I think we found the migration of one very specific um, butterfly that was very isolated in an area moved mm -hmm. and we can actually trace it through the connect to protect homeowners. So that was incredible. 
um, I think, it, was it the Florida Dusky Wing? It was, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. And so, also with, with the Connect to Protect program, you can help go to our preserves and help Jennifer and the staff there monitor and do rare plant work on our preserves. Um, because quite often we, when we do plant rescues, when we've dug up plants and that, um, the Connect to Protect volunteers have been just critical to assist us at this time on those kinds of things. So um, that's, that's another way to help us with, with um, volunteering right now, since we don't really have a volunteer program up and running. We do have some really passive things like um, greenhouse work and a few other things like that, but, and picking up trash at some, adopting some of our preserves. But if you wanna be even more involved in the technical aspect, you may wanna volunteer with the, the the connect to protect when they when they go to monitor our rare plants. Yeah, and also I want to do one little piece. The Florida Native Plant Society is a good way to you know learn your plants and all that stuff. So, um, right. Barbara McAdams. Well, thank you, Leslie. Shout out to Leslie. Good job. Um, my question is, is there um, any thoughts to contacting the school that's going to go up on that Coral Commons um, property that, that got um, cleared, um, getting them in the loop on, on their new landscape plans? Should it, it could be all Pine Rockland and they could possibly help to rebuild what was lost there. So, so the conversation with the school board is, um, is not limited to just, you know, there's future ideas and plans of what other properties they can put on our list and discussions of how we can partner with them. So the, you know, a lot of these things are still ongoing, but there's, you know, like I said, there's hope. Some of the lands were on our list for since 1993, and there we go, you know, we bought them at the end. So and we've definitely got a good relationship with them, and the conversations are not going to end. So thank you, Barbara. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else, guys? No other questions from what I can see. So I am looking at some of the names and we have some wonderful people still around. So um, I definitely, Naki, I want to talk to you on Zoom more often, you know, and I'm definitely looking forward to the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos field trips much more than I am to my own. <laughs> So, I think that's it. Oh, two more questions. Suzanne, come oh. here. Mel, oh. please allow her to talk. Don't touch Jenny. I won't. <laughs> so, Suzanne. Hello, Janet. It was so hey. great to hear not only you, but your whole team especially from Joy with her historical perspective and new people that I haven't met yet. So thank you so much for all the work you do. Um, I actually, did I mention the mosquito control um, point or did I glaze past it in my fury to hurry up? I don't think I heard it, but. Okay, so sorry, Suzanne, because that was actually you know, specifically directed towards you. So I'm glad you're, you're here. Um, so I want you to know, after years, um, the O program finally um, has a formal agreement that has been approved by the state of Florida um, for our mosquito control, well, with our mosquito control folks to have a buffer spray area of, I think, 200 feet um, from our properties. So, I mean, that's monumental. That great. Good. Yes. I mean, Joy, 
Joy told me to say, we do have a caveat if there is an emergency like Zika or anything like that. Um, they, they do have the ability to contact us and we'll work with them and so that they can spray in those areas if it's a, you know, a public health emergency. But, but the fact that they're just, there's an acknowledgement, there are maps in their hands right now, there's a cog, you know, there's a conscientious awareness that these areas need to be protected, you know, it's out there and we're working with them. So we want to say, you know, that was done through friendships in the mosquito control office. So great. We need to remember that bugs are awesome. Although yes. mosquitoes can be a pain. I agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'm still waiting for that rare and threatened mosquito to appear in, you know, our eel <laughs> pine rockland. We need more bats. <laughs> yes, Wait, we can. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's our mosquito. My, by the way, that's our secret mosquito control plan is more bats. Did, so, did Dan um, have a question? <laughs> I think she got I, muted. No, oh. I, I was just praising you guys. Oh, okay. Oh, really thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Suzanne. Um, Kim Heiss, it looks like Kim Heiss has her hand raised. Yes, we've got Leslie and Kim and now John. So I'm gonna go down the list. The next one is Leslie. Okay. Hey, Leslie. Sorry, I'm back again. I also wanted to ask you, is there a place you can look up the EEL properties, those that are accessible to the public that can be walked? Like I recently discovered the Gloria Floyd um, Rockland that I got to walk through, but, and that's right in my neighborhood, but there must be others that I am not aware of. Is there a good place to look at that list? Um, yeah, so right now, it's, since it's ever evolving and we're, you know, some of them, we may be, I wanna say, the list is not always stagnant. Because of restoration activities, for example, we might close off a site if we have heavy equipment contractors working out there for doing specific land management techniques and things like that. So I usually say, you know, that there are some that are almost always open and Joy can provide a list to you if you reach out to our program of the sites that are open. Um, as we continue to acquire and open sites, it, it's changing all the time. And then just know that EEL manages a lot of the um, a, a lot of land within those 18 parks that we mentioned previously, like 80 barns and Tropical Park and things like that. And those are open to the public. Right. So great, thank you. No problem. So next one. Oh, hi. <laughs> so first, I want to say thank you to you. Your artwork is incredible. So oh, thank you so much. <laughs> for all the folks that are still on this call, um, Kim is the um, artist that did the rendering for the Pine Rockland Working Group Conference this year. So and I imagine that that's one of your little paintings there. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that, that they, my artwork got used in that way um, because I love making art about the Pine Rocklands. Um, I wanted to say thank you, you guys, for the history of the EEO the EEL program. And um, it's very interesting. And I was also wondering if the recording will be available. Uh, is it on the website, the, um, the conference website? So we're going to provide it to Jen Posley. And, um, and if she can post it and it's allowed, then, you know, there might, I don't know about bandwidth issues and things like that, if it will be a concern, but we can definitely do it. And if not, she, she will um, have our email address there. And Christine, um, my secretary, can definitely um, provide it to you. But we're going to try and post. Great. All right. Thanks so much, you guys. Awesome. And John. Uh, Mel, can you please unmute John? Hey, hello, my name is John. I work at Everglades National Park. 
Uh, good job. So another thing I'd like to throw at you a little bit. Um, thank you for the overview, the history. It is a shock to see what was and what is, and so you're fighting the good fight. Um, besides knowing your bass, you should also know about dragonflies. Whenever they're around, we don't have much of an issue with uh, mosquitoes. Yes. Well, um, we so one of the Yale staff members is married to a National Park Service, Everglades National Park biologist, who is um, a specialist in dragonflies. So he makes us watch out for them. Okay, and I good. notice when the dragonflies are out for the same yeah. reason that when yeah. we have a lot well, of them. A little piece of trivia for you. When the, when, um, the mosquitoes are um, in the water, they don't feed on larvae. And the reason, and it's kind of neat because you, you don't exhaust your food supply when you become adult later on. Um, the thing I want to know is how much you might have used Everglades as a partner um, you know, Jimmy Saddle, those guys for plant ID, but um, I don't know, it's amazing what the diversity of plants are um, throughout the Pinelands of uh, where you are situated versus Everglades. Um, East Coast, what we have versus West Coast, um, much different, um, highly diverse. Um, but yeah, um, any kind of interactive uh, besides marrying into the situation. I was gonna say, I've worked let me, let me do it from a historical background. Excellent. We had worked with Everglades National Park at the very beginning in the early 80s, which gave rise to the Exotic Pest Plant Council. Our staff used to volunteer. I used to fly out in helicopters and treat Melaleuca back in the 80s. So we have always worked very closely with Everglades. Um, we know all your biologists, the fire management people. We do cross trainings together with that. Hillary's probably on my speed dial, so is Jimmy. So yeah, we do work very close with each other and the research people because most of the, a good portion of the park is located within Miami-Dade County till about Mahogany Hammock is our Western boundary. So we consider the park part of our ecosystem as well. Even though you're separate and, and different rules in that, we do consider you part of our ecosystem. So thank yeah. you. For that. So, you know, I remember the name Rick Anderson, you know? Oh, so, I do too. Yeah. And so we work with Aaron Land, with Michael. I am going to butcher his last name, but Michael G U I. Uh, Gooey. And I can go back to Bob Dorn and Dr. Robertson. I'm showing my, my, yeah. my years at the No, camp. no, I actually, I, I yeah. had. Uh, um, uh, I had Dr. Bill actually sign a paper I found of his uh, proposing this uh, craziness of doing fires in the thing called Everglades Journal. And uh, he said, I hadn't heard that and I thought of this in a long time. So yeah, the well, class. I want yeah. you to know the very first meeting we had of the Pine Rockland Working Group, we called it the Bill Robertson Working Group. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we realized it was more than just the park that it was, you know, we started bringing in the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos and, and our partners in the Keys and everything. So we stopped calling it, but our very first workshop was dedicated to Bill and, and him going out and burning the woods. So we understand how important the park history is to our lands and vice versa. And um, not only are we married into it, but you also have staff that used to work for the old program, like Jenny, you know, and, um, and we've been working mm -hmm. with Hillary, like Joy said, for years. In addition, not just in the Pine Rockland world, but we are also working with the National Park Service from a germ perspective and, you know, and our you know, involvement. SERP, SERP yeah, and, in, and we're, issues, yeah, so, so we are partners the whole way. Yeah, we are, we are definitely connected to the park. We work on, you know, it wasn't relevant to this talk, sure. the, the Everglades component other than on a very high level, but we're, we serve on the SERP PDTs. We have folks, you know, that are dialed in from Durham in this call that, you know, are fundamental in Everglades restoration. So, 
the yield program, actually our largest acquisition project is the South Dade Wetlands Project. And we also, James happens to be the preserve manager for Cutler Wetlands and all of it is part of this SERP world. So we work with not just your national park, but also with Biscayne, so. And also yeah. the whole hole in the donut restoration was also something that was started through a partnership with our department. Think, the, yeah. yeah. Amazing how many permutations that had to go through before, before they realized they had to get rid of the rock plowed lands in order yeah. to yes. foster uh, native plants. Um, yeah, Dennis, Jared, and I help out with that uh, deal every year. Um, we'll have to be virtual, I guess, this year. I've and uh, you know, Michael it was and last I week. With, it was last week. Was, was it? Last week. Um, yeah, yeah. I usually, I'll drive over with Dennis um, to go help out with the food and stuff. But you guys are virtual, I think, and I missed out. Dennis didn't call me. I should have called him. Yeah. Um, well, I think they were last week. Yep. So. I think okay. they recorded it, so there's still an opportunity yeah. there. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you didn't you. get the special lunch that's always there. Help out with that. Yeah. But yeah, I, I work over on the West Coast. Um, so I'm over okay. uh, Everglades National there, over Gulf Coast. But um, right. also I work with state um, for Beckhatchee Strand. So there's a lot of other outreach that we do as partners for this amazing place called Florida. So thank you for being so, here and thank so you for the quick you question, do. John. Um, so yeah. your West Coast, do you ever work with the land acquisition um, program in Collier? I, I don't, but what I have... Okay. Um, I used to do a variety of maps. I did fire for Bicey for Big Cypress for a while. and mm -hmm. um, But okay. um, I'm a fisheries guy. So I, I'm a botanist of background. There's a lot of crazy stuff in my, I like wearing lots of hats. And okay. uh, I like to branch out and help partners because ecosystems are not known by boundaries that uh, you know, yes. people put on maps. Yep. Exactly. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody well. else? You know, other hands raised? Last call. Yeah, I see see a couple of names that I recognize, but I'm not gonna call on them. I'm not gonna be mean. Okay, just time to wrap it up then. Okay, thank you. So everybody has about 30 minutes before they have to get to Naki. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everybody. Thank Bye you. everyone. Bye. Thank you. I think it went smashingly. Yeah. Okay. All right. There we bye. go.